Does my talking about this count as YouTube drama again? Nah. This is corporate nonsense. I never get tired of that. Hey, folks. So it's oh, the timing of these things are very funny. What was originally going to go up today, and it's still going to happen. I've already shot it, but it's just going to happen later because it's a little bit of an evergreen topic. Um, I was going to be talking about sort of uh, some of the corporate machinations that lend themselves to just a lot of crap, the general premise of things costing more and you getting less, uh, that whole thing. Uh, that I'm bumping because something more localized to YouTube happened that enables me to talk about a very specific wedge of corporate BS. We're gonna talk about The Escapist. Now, if you don't know who they are, if you don't know what that website, what that channel, or any of the people involved in it are, I'm hoping you'll still stick around because I'm gonna give you the context you need, but I'm also gonna put it into context of some other stuff you might have heard of and just talk overall about why this happens because this is all a very natural outcropping of our incredibly consolidated um, capitalist-driven uh, world. This is what happens when almost everything has a parent company. Almost no uh, entity that is self-sustaining is truly independent once it reaches a certain level in size. Like, there are some, obviously, YouTube, there are a fair number, but a lot of things that you think, okay, but that's that's a profitable, self-sustaining business, isn't it? Well, it might be. Doesn't matter, because it's owned by somebody else. And whether or not they're successful will not determine whether or not they have a future. I'll explain all this as we go. So, let's get some context in here first. A little bit of history on The Escapist. It was originally a digital magazine it has always specialized in gaming content, be it reviews, breaking news, development stories, etc., things of that nature. It's also covered some stuff in regards to, say, movies and things like that, but it's primarily gaming focused and pretty much always has been. In 2007, they started putting out uh, video content on a YouTube channel, uh, also hosting it on their own site, and it was primarily done by contractors, the most famous of which is Yahtzee Croshaw, who created Zero Punctuation, which has always been the biggest draw of not only the YouTube channel, but of the Escapist website as a whole. Zero Punctuation being five to six minute long animated, very punchy, fast paced, and highly critical reviews of video games. I know I only just got on board the Dark Souls pain train, choo choo, all aboard for driving straight into a brick wall, but no one's more critical of drinking than a former alcoholic. And yes, I did just imply that not being into Dark Souls is equivalent to a major destructive personality flaw. I've enjoyed Yahtzee's work for a while. I've name dropped him a few times in reference to other things. I've even used a clip of his stuff at least once. If you know it's bad, why are you doing it? But some other people who might be names you recognize that did get involved with the escapists for a while, there was Stephanie Sterling uh, with the Jimquisition, there was Miracle of Sound, um, both of whom have been independent for a very long time, but they initially were uh, on The Escapist as it was on YouTube. Now, The Escapist has not been drama-free in its lifetime. Starting around 2011, there started being tension with various elements and parts and creators involved in it, and some of them starting splitting away. That included Stephanie Sterling, that included folks like Bob Chipman, uh, Movie Bob. I don't want to dig into him too much. He's, people have very strong opinions on him, and I don't want to get into it, but you know he was part of that group. But they all started breaking away eventually to the point that pretty much the only output of the YouTube channel and the primary draw of the website itself was just Yahtzee. It was just zero punctuation or whatever side project Yahtzee did for a while. Things like uh, judging by the cover. Hello, ladies, and welcome to Judging by the Cover, where we'll be judging Spectre by the poster. During this period when it was kind of hemorrhaging creatives, they were either quitting or being let go or not having contracts renewed, the parent company of The Escapist was sold to Defy Media. Now in 2018, The Escapist was sold to Enthusiast Gaming, 
who brought back some of the old folks, not many of whom stayed, but basically attempted to relaunch and bring it back to its earlier glory days before everybody started jumping ship. That started working out okay, but then in 2019, they brought in Nick Calandra, who served as the editor-in-chief. He was pr internally promoted to take on that position, and he started really focusing on not just bringing back new things or trying to recapture old glory, but creating something new. Because since Yahtzee was still around and was reliable, ZP coming out every single week, they knew that whoever was here for him would stay here for him. But they needed to get new voices in here, get new audiences in, give people a reason to come to the escapist other than just Yahtzee. And over the last four years, he's done precisely that. While nothing has quite reached the reliable numbers that Zero Punctuation does, various other things have hit pretty high success rates for what are admittedly, as far as raw numbers go, secondary concerns. Things like the output of a creator who goes by Frost, who's done series like Cold Take and Stuff of Legends, both of whom have managed to crack six digits worth of views. There's the D&D campaign, Adventure is Nigh, which has a much smaller audience, but a very dedicated and highly engaged audience, which is always an audience that you can get more out of in terms of them being willing to throw money at the project. Now, the company changed hands again because it was sold from the Enthusiast Gaming to the Gamers Group a little over a year ago. And what's more, everything got much more integrated. The site before had always kind of felt like it was a collection of a number of independent creators. Like, there was occasionally crossover, like Stephanie Sterling and uh, Yahtzee had done a few things together before Steph left the site. But, um, by and large, it felt all very confined. That was like a crossover. It didn't feel like a team. The way it's been the last couple of years has really felt like a team. They're on streams together. They're referencing each other's work. They're having very relaxed conversations. It feels very much like something special was built up. And earlier this week, Nick Calandra was let go from the escapists. He was not the only one fired. Jack Packard, who was the DM for Adventurous Nye, the D&D campaign, him and a couple of others were fired. Um, but so far as can be told... From what I could find, most of the people who are now no longer there weren't fired. So folks like Yahtzee, and indeed the entire video creation team, literally everybody involved in the video creation, have resigned if they weren't fired. Escape has fired Nick, who was the person who had built it up into what it currently is, and then everyone who was still there went, okay, well, we're leaving with him then. What's going on since then all happened very fast. They have already launched a new project called Second Wind Group. Um, the YouTube channel had 40, 000, over 40,000 subscribers before it even had its first live stream explaining what it was they were even, pl even planning to do, which basically amounts to um, for what projects are wholly owned by their original creators, which some of them are. Those will just continue to the best of their ability. Um, but with some things such as, say, zero punctuation, there will be a new legally distinct replacement for it being done uh, on this new project. So the entire creative team, everyone who contributed to the YouTube channel, is all gone. Why did corporate think it was a good idea to get rid of the guy who had built this thing into what it was? Well, huh, we'll get into that. But I don't think they wanted this outcome. Because, well, I'm going to make some parallels to some other instances. This was not a case of they fired everybody. They only tried to really get rid of something that, the word is that corporate was never really fully on board with Adventure is Nigh. It's probably why that was usually the main fundraising focus whenever they live stream was that it would fund Adventure is Nigh. I think they had to keep proving themselves financially that it was worth doing. But corporate never seemed to be behind that very much. And so they got rid of the guy who did that, but also the guy who had made a team and an organization that everyone liked to work for. And huge shock, you get rid of the guy who made the place an enjoyable place to work and who was the one who personally hired most of these people, pretty much everybody who wasn't Yahtzee. Yeah. They don't want to be here if he's not going to be there. Because even if you just replace him and like aren't firing them, it's very safe for them to assume, well, you're not going to keep the atmosphere that we were enjoying working in. If you wanted to keep that, you wouldn't have gotten rid of Nick. 
Now, I want to reemphasize, Escapist is not, strictly speaking, only the YouTube channel. It is still it's a, it is still a website. It does still have written stuff. Don't take it out on any of the writers still employed by the Escapist. They're not responsible for any of this. But people who have been around on the internet for a while have seen something similar than this before. Again, while it was not necessarily uh, clear that they wanted to scrap their entire video making department, uh, the Escapist was probably better known for its video output than the stuff written for its website, not to demean anyone who either has or still is writing for them. But you can't help but think of stuff like Cracked or College Humor. These things that appeared to be successful were well known for video content and had their stuff completely shut down. So to make comparisons and also to build into my greater points about why does this kind of stuff happen at all, uh, let's go over some of those real quick. I'm gonna start with Cracked. Now that began as an actual magazine. It was a knockoff of Mad Magazine, it started back in 1958. It launched a website in 2005 and started to build momentum with its written material. A lot of it consisting of lists and very irreverent articles, things like, you know, these weird connections or these things you didn't realize. A little bit buzzfeedy, but with a much more deliberately humorous bent. They had comedy writers putting a very harsh comedy spin on these things. I am a little bit uh, biased in favor of the uh, Cracked website. I did actually, in fact, uh, full disclosure, write an article for them back in 2015 uh, and was paid to do so. That article I'm still kind of proud of, even though what is in it is not accurate to my life any longer and hasn't been for a little bit. But the creation of that did effectively lead to the creation of my first own written work and published book. So I, I am a little bit biased in their favor and they were great to work with certainly at the time. As I said, I was paid for the piece, but also they paired me with somebody on their team to help me mold it in terms of having it punched up and jokeified to the degree that it would play well with their audience. I was never encouraged to put anything false or inaccurate to my life or experience, but just helping me with the presentation of it. It was a lot of fun and I enjoyed doing it. But regardless of that, what they kind of got even bigger on was on YouTube. In 2009, Crack started putting video content up on YouTube, including some incredibly successful series, such as After Hours, and then later on, Some News. Now, in 2016, Cracked was bought by the American broadcast company EW Scripps. And in 2017, Scripps fired the entire video team to cut costs due to the losses at the company overall. They owned Cracked for a little more than a year and a half, and then they fired the entire video team, as I said, to cut costs. This might seem all very strange, but like, it was successful, wasn't it? Well, yes, but this was also around a time when what YouTube was pushing and what was playing well was in the process of shifting. It was actually hitting a time that was very difficult for anything that was uh, of high production value. So comedy sketches, animation, etc., got really difficult because YouTube started pushing longer material put out more regularly, which tend to, tend to favor things like Let's Plays and reaction content, which is part of why that stuff has gotten so big in the last five to eight years. Now, much like what is currently going on with The Escapist Cracks, their actual website never stopped producing content, but the YouTube channel effectively went dead for a while. Scripps, even after this cost cutting, would end up selling the company to literally media in 2019. They have tried to relaunch and bring back uh, video content starting in 2020. Some of it has done okay, but it's doing nowhere near the numbers. But hold on to that fact that Scripps uh, did all this for cost cutting to cover for losses because, let's be clear about this, and I will come back to it, it wasn't losses suffered because of Cracked. Hold on to that, we'll come back to it. Let's talk about College Humor. College Humor starts out as a website in 1999. In 2006, its parent company's controlling majority of shares gets sold to a company called IAC. It's a holdings company. Also in 2006, College Humor starts uploading YouTube videos. In 2018, College Humor launched Dropout, which was a subscription service with more stuff. It had uh, a couple of exclusive shows. It had longer versions of stuff, behind the scenes things. Basically uh, an attempt to say, hey, give us extra money if you want even more of our stuff and want to help us to do what we do. 
And at the time, that kind of made sense, because as I said, at the time, due to the shift in YouTube's algorithm and what they were favoring, yeah, things had made it harder for channels like uh, College Humor to be profitable. Dropout would become home to a number of breakout hits, such as Um Actually, Dimension 20, and Game Changer, until College Humor was pretty much completely shut down in 2020. So what happened in 2020, this all happened at once, and it, it, it happened so fast that it Actually, unless you were paying attention, figuring out the full cause and effect got a little dicey. But here's what happens the best as I understand it. In 2020, IAC was like, this isn't making the money that we would like. Again, doesn't mean it's not profitable, but it's not making what we want. So we're shutting it down. Now, this is one of the interesting quirks of what happened in this case, is that since this was basically just killing the entirety of of college humor, unlike, say, Cracked, where it's like, well, we'll keep the website, or The Escapist, where, yes, they still have the website. Killing the college humor uh, video creation team and the YouTube channel and Dropout and all that, that was pretty much everything it was. So the brand itself suddenly became worthless, which actually meant that IAC was willing to sell the college humor media company and brand to Sam Reich, who had been sort of heading up the thing, but, you know, was working for IAC. So simultaneously, like, all this got shut down, and Reich had control of it. Now, at the time, he only had the funds to maintain employment of seven employees, only one of whom was on the creative side. That was Brennan Lee Mulligan. Everybody else had to be cut. But Reich, for the past three years, has been rebuilding College Humor, now rebranded as Dropout, to what it is, well, to what it was before they killed it, and it appears to be a completely self-sustaining and profitable model. Again, as I said, the issue was not that this was an unprofitable thing. It was. It demonstrably is. They are successful once they no longer have co corporate overlords to answer to. So why are successful, or at the very least, something that is not failing and isn't losing you money why are these getting shut down, revamped, killed? Why did that happen to College Humor, to Cracked? Why did the escapist think it was a good idea to get rid of the guy who had completely revamped it into something that was more successful than it had been in years? Why? Because of corporate nonsense. Let's get into that. Here's the thing I think a lot of folks really don't understand about corporate structuring, and especially in a world where we are talking about parent companies and conglomerates, and a company might seem like a wholly self-sustaining thing, but it's still owned by somebody else. I think the wisdom a lot of people carry with them, or an assumption a lot of people make, is that if something gets shut down by a parent company, it's because that thing wasn't profitable. Like, it was kicking around the parent company, you know, they either bought it and it wasn't doing well or they tried to build it up, but it was losing money. It was a weight around their neck. So like you cut the thing that isn't profitable. And sometimes, yes, sometimes that is what happens. But other times, a business that if it were independent, if it were a self-sustained, completely isolated thing like Dropout now is and like Second Wind is going to be, it is successful. It makes the money it needs to to pay its employees and to bring in the revenue to keep sustaining itself. So it's clearly not a loss, but it can still be shut down and often still called cost cutting, even though this isn't losing them, the owners, any money. Why? Because they don't view these as independent companies, as something that needs to sustain itself. And if it, if it does, if it's, if it's not costing us anything and if it's bringing in money, oh, well, I mean, why would we get rid of them? That's punishing them when they didn't do anything wrong. That's not how they look at it. These are just assets to these companies. When you're talking parent companies, when you're talking holdings companies, when you're talking conglomerates, et cetera, you are talking about people who view these companies as assets only. And so when time comes around that something has gone wrong, even if it has nothing to do with some of these individual companies, but like for whatever reason, money's tight, you didn't close a deal that you thought you needed to, you invested in something that didn't work out well, or 
Maybe you just didn't grow as much as you told your shareholders that you were going to. Suddenly, it becomes expedient to pad your books by cutting expenses. When your numbers come up short, when the, when the numbers are run for how much money you told your investors and shareholders that you were going to bring in this quarter and it doesn't make it, a really quick way to pad those numbers is to cut expenses. Is this thing costing us money? No, but that's a bunch of money we could cut. And it probably wouldn't hurt that much. Not us. It'll hurt all the people whose jobs just got lost despite the fact that they were doing good work and, and uh, successful work. No, nah, that doesn't matter. We got to pad the books. That's what you need to understand. The decisions to kill these companies sometimes is a reflection of the company itself, the subsidiary company, failing. But it is often, more often, I would say, a reflection of something's gone wrong at the corporate level. And we got to tighten the belt. Of course, they never tighten their own belts. They never take a pay cut at the executive level. They decide to get rid of other people. This is what happens when you have these massive companies and everything just gets bought. Once you get a certain degree of success, something, somebody just comes along and buys you. This is what happens. They don't care about you as a company. You're an asset. And when times are tough, you jettison assets. Whether it is an asset that has residuals that you're getting or not, like we got to jettison some assets, uh, that one. They don't care that there are people attached to it. They don't care whether what they do is successful. They don't see you as people. They don't even see you as a company. You're just an asset on the books for them to sell or scrap to pad their numbers. That's why this keeps happening. And it's why it's really rewarding to see things happen like how dropout has risen from the ashes of college humor, of how I expect Second Wind is going to rise from the ashes of The Escapist. Now, will The Escapist continue to exist? I don't know. We'll see. They haven't been without zero punctuation since 2007, and it has always been the biggest draw. So I don't know what the heck they think they're going to do now. The simple truth is they needed Yahtzee more than he needed them, but he never really had a reason to leave before. Well, they gave him one when they got rid of the boss that he realized he really liked working for. And I love this detail. I, I want to think this was on purpose. The very first thing that was put up on Second Wind, uh, their YouTube channel, was a live stream featuring Nick and featuring Yahtzee. And it went out at the exact same time on the exact same day that normally a new zero punctuation would have gone live on The Escapist. That feels like a middle finger. And as a juicy bonus on this, there was no news uh, zero punctuation that went live on The Escapist at the time it should have. Not because they didn't have them. Yahtzee rather famously is two weeks ahead on his stuff. So in theory, The Escapist has two more episodes of zero punctuation that they could be uploading. And they didn't. And I don't think it was a deliberate choice. When I tell you the entire video the entire video team resigned, I mean at every level. Front of camera, voices, production, back end, everybody. They all left. I don't think there's anybody still at The Escapist who even has access to the YouTube channel to be able to put the video live. That's how much they screwed up. It's so frustrating as a creative as someone who yes enjoys some of the work of these people not just yahtzee i mentioned frost i like his stuff i haven't gotten heavily into adventures nine but the bits i've heard of it it was a lot of fun and there absolutely was an atmosphere that really seemed like these people enjoyed working with each other that was just fun to be around i would listen to the podcast on occasion it was a great dynamic it was a good feel i'll happily follow them somewhere else why would I stay at The Escapist? That's the other thing about these corporations. If they keep the thing at all, which they don't always, sometimes they just kill it. But if they see value in anything, it's the brand. It's the name. It's not the talent. Why would you retain the talent? We've got the name. We've got the brand that everybody loves. We can get rid of the talent and just uh, bring other people in if we feel like it's worth doing, which is what Cracked has been trying to do. It's not really working. And that's not to knock some of the newer stuff that's on Cracked. And I kind of feel bad for the people who are trying to bring it back to what it was, but 
the people who were there moved on to other stuff. Some of whom making, you know, legally distinct versions of what they were doing on there and doing it now more successfully. Creative companies, when they get bought by these parent companies, it is almost always eventually the death of them, sooner or later. They're either going to be shut down or they're going to be gutted from what they were. It's going to become a shell, a name, a brand, where the talent that is involved in it is not the ones who made it something you cared about in the first place. That's not to say that new talent brought in can't also be good or can't revitalize something or take it in a new direction. I'm not trying to knock the idea of bringing in new talent. Heck, Nick did that with The Escapist. That was a major part of what he did. But as I get invested in the talent, I don't care what the name on the site is. This is why there are some names and brands and companies that are still kicking around despite the fact that the original company that that name was attached to has not existed for a long time. You know how many different companies have gotten to call themselves Atari because the companies keep going out of business and then the name goes up for sale? Because they think the name has value. And there's some nostalgic value, yeah, but you still have to continue to do something anybody cares about. And they don't. You might find yourself wondering, well, if being bought out by a different company, if having a parent company is such a bad thing, why do smaller companies do it? Why do they even let themselves get bought? Well, there's a very simple answer, but there's also nuance to it. The very simple answer is for money. That said, there is nuance to that. Um, because while, yes, the answer is ultimately they do it for money, the nature of why for money has some fine tuning for it. Because there are some companies that are either started by or eventually get acquired and controlled by somebody who just is looking for a payout. And if they're looking at getting a one-time payment that amounts to running the site for the next 10 years, but they can get all that at once and then they don't have to do the job anymore, yeah, a lot of people will tell you just, just to take the money. But then you also have instances where a company gets acquired, but the upper management or even the CEO or the person who used to own it now stays on as like, head of a board or something because they actually do care about that thing. And in cases like that, you might be looking at something that was barely financially successful and this would, in theory, give them a safety net and, uh, you know, a little breathing room. Possibly this isn't just a buyout, but a promise to inject some more money into whatever the project might be, in which case this might be thought of as a way to actually build it into something more than it could have been without being bought out by somebody else. That is still ultimately for money in any case, but it is at least a situation where the money is not necessarily intended to immediately line somebody's pocket. Maybe it is for the benefit of the business, but ultimately they get bought out for money. Although sometimes they get bought out for survival. Like I said, sometimes it might be a company that is really barely making buy, or sometimes you have companies that are started up and they actually don't even have a plan to become successful, they're started up with a promise to get big and then the company is sold on the promise of how big it's gonna be and that allows owners to sell it before they even have to turn it into something profitable, then it's the responsibility of the parent company. It's a borderline grift sometimes. That wasn't the case in any of the three companies we're talking about, to be clear, we're expanding out into a bigger conversation at this point. But there's that, but also beyond that, saying no, to a buyout offer can actually be dangerous. There's the traditional hostile takeover, though that wouldn't really apply in the cases of the kind of companies we've been talking about. Because a true hostile takeover involves um, stocks and shares. Short version of how a hostile takeover works is that um, the heads of a company, um, you know, they have an offer to buy the company, they turn it down, they don't want it. And so the people who made the offer then basically go around the heads of the company and start going to the shareholders and the stockholders and buying the stocks and shares directly from them until they have a majority share, in which case they control the company even though the people who managed it and didn't want to actually sell them. That's a hostile takeover. So if you're dealing with a company that isn't big enough to have stockholders and shareholders, then that kind of hostile takeover isn't gonna be the case. That having been said, it can still be dangerous because there are more than a few cases of companies who have made offers to buy a smaller company, been turned down, and have then in some way deliberately sabotaged that company. Bethesda did this with the video game studio Human Head. So if you're a smaller company, saying no to a buyout might be 
profitable, you might think or hope that maybe it'll be a good thing. Or you might think if we don't take this, they're going to do something in some way to make our lives more difficult and annihilate us. Because oftentimes when these companies are bought, sometimes it's because it's thought of as an addition to the portfolio, doing something that other companies we own don't do, or maybe it complements the stuff that our other companies do, or maybe it's seen as a competitor to things the company are, uh, the parent company already owns. In which case, well, we either buy them or we kill them. Either way, they won't be a competitor anymore. Business is cutthroat because it's all profit-driven. It's about money. It's not about people. It's not even about individual businesses being profitable because you can have something where as an independent business, it would have been completely profitable, but it's owned by a parent company and somebody at the high end of that parent company decided to try and sink money into NFTs and it didn't work. And now they're going to cut hundreds or even thousands of jobs from underneath them to pay for their nonsense and their mistakes. That's the thing about being owned by a parent company. You can have your job or your entire company that is a subsidiary be killed because of nothing you did wrong, because of mistakes made by people who do not know your name and don't give a crap about you, but who will make you jobless to cover for their nonsense and to pad their books. But every now and then, it goes in a nice direction like with Dropout, and now hopefully with Second Wind, made up of folks from The Escapist. I'll be keeping an eye on, as I said, there's a fair number of people involved in this who I've come to like their work. Case of Yahtzee for a very long time, but case of some of the rest of them more recently. But I wish them the best because while Escapist didn't come in and fire them all, it was very clear that they were coming in to completely upend what had been built and what was continuing to grow, to be clear. Now, from what Nick is saying, they were still hung up on the fact that ZP did numbers so much bigger than everything else, except, you know, it's the longest or anything. It's always been the biggest thing and it's been here for uh, over 15 years. I forget how long it's been running at this point, but a dang, a dang long time. So yeah, it's always going to pull the bigger numbers, but they would use that as a cudgel to judge him for everything that he oversaw that didn't do those kinds of numbers. So even though he built something enjoyable, sustainable, profitable, didn't matter. They just saw numbers. That's all they ever cared about. Creatives need more control over what they do because while I understand that the money for a lot of these projects has to come from somewhere, when you don't let creators create, then this is what happens. They just get cut because you can't justify the artistry of something when somebody only cares about the numbers. And that doesn't mean that any organization or corporation is forced, should be forced to support a failing artistic endeavor. No, but you know, again, this isn't a matter of, oh, we're losing money. This is a matter of we're not growing as much or as fast as we want. We didn't make as much more this year than last year, as we told our investors we would. But that kind of starts to dovetail into what was originally gonna be the video coming out today, uh, talking about, well, in shitification, if you know what that term means. That video is still gonna come out, and so I've got more thoughts on all that, and you can wait for that. Uh, it's probably not gonna be next week. I, I wanna get something like a little bit more uh, sort of thanksgivings e seasonal out for uh, next Saturday. And then after that, we get into new episodes of Doctor Who that I get to review. So um, be aware that the uh, Enchidification video might be a little ways off, but it is already shot and it is definitely coming. But uh, yeah, I'm getting to go off on corporate nonsense quite a bit lately. And while I hate that I'm able to go off on this stuff so much, I ain't mad to bitch about it. What are your thoughts on this? Whatever they are on what happened at the Escapist specifically about this kind of thing, about anything that I've shared with you today. Drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon pays the bills and ensures that I'm able to do this as my living. I don't have a parent company. I don't have a corporate overlord. And that's not being said as a brag. I could not do this without the support from Patreon. But even if you can't help me out that way, there's links to other things I do in the description. And of course, like, share, and subscribe. They all help. Don't worry too much about it though. 
What I really want you to remember is that you are beautiful, you are valid, you are loved. You are the council and I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. Time to thank some patrons, and this time I'm going to say their names as if I'm greeting them, welcoming them to a party. Robin Moore, Zubin Lafula, Goddess Elida, Tarak, the thing that goes doink in the anime, Ruth, Gozer the Gozarian, Oliver B, Solitary Pictures, Ulrich Bogdan, Melinda Walters, Jen, Auntie Kate 808, Becky Sparks, Fanabi Likes the Poodle, Robin Powell, T Love, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casperl, Dave Hall, Rosalind Bennett. Have fun tonight, and thank you for your support. I don't know why I decided to do that this time, but I don't know. I'm having fun. <laughs>